Hello, everyone. This is the CT Teach Podcast, and we are your moderators. I am Christopher McClung, and this is... Grant Hermes. Howdy ho. Hi. And so this month, we are highlighting the foods industry, and we are excited to share with you our guest panelists of culinary educators and professional chefs. So, panel, if you could, please go around, introduce yourselves, sharing your name and what you do to the audience. Hi, I'm Nicole Pugel. I teach four levels of culinary at Glendale High School. Hey, I'm Chanel Tate. I teach culinary art level one and level two at Citrus Valley High School in Redmond, California. Hello, everyone. My name is Juan Guzman. I am a curry sous chef at Spotted Hen and chef and owner at Satisfied LA. So uh, uh, first, we want to say thank you for listening to the audience. This podcast was created in partnership with the California Department of Education. And the purpose of this show is to bring forth relevant and in-depth discussion regarding teaching, education, mentoring, and most of all, career and technical education, or CTE. Awesome. So we're going to start this podcast out by first playing a game. And so to be fair, those of you who listened to our last episode, we played a game to where the panelists did not know a lot of the answers. You remember our mushy, our mushy movie game? Mm-hmm. Um, and part of the reason that they, that they didn't know that is because they could see my screen that I had shared evidently. They just kept looking at the background of whatever panda I happen to have up at that moment. Um, so, so for this one, we're going to play a game. And let me know, first of all, if you can see my screen. Um, and hopefully I do it right this time. Yes. All right. Now we're on a roll. So this game is called That Looks Good Enough to Eat. And the way it works is I'm going to show you a series of pictures containing food. However, some of these foods have been tampered with for advertising purposes. And your job is to recognize those fake foods and say one of two things. Either that looks good enough to eat or there's no way I would eat that. And for every correct answer you get, you'll get a point. Grant, you could do us a favor and maybe kind of best you can keep track of tabs and oh, he's got his iPad gotcha, out, he's sir. ready to go. <laughs> so again, you're gonna say either that looks good enough to eat or there's no way I would eat that. You guys ready? Get this started. So here is picture number one. And it is a picture of pancakes, um, which looks like some voluptuous syrup being poured on them. That looks good enough to eat. That looks good enough to eat. There's no way. (laughs) I'd eat it. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So we have two, two that looks good enough to eat. One of them is there's a no way I would eat that. Well, the correct answer, let's find out. There's no way we would eat that because (laughs) that syrup on those pancakes is actually motor oil, which photographers use to make it look a little bit more liquidy and juicy than it actually is so i would agree That's never disgusting. eating pancakes again i could tell that even brown <laughs> no one's pancakes are that even brown <laughs> you know pins oil pins oil pancakes all right next one how about this one we have a bowl of some sort of meat substance with a lot of good enough. cilantro i need it good enough i need that that's good enough all right and you would be correct it's beef i don't know how to pronounce that media Media. Media. all right um and then all of the recipes that are correct are on allrecipes.com so you can actually go there type that in you'll be able to find the recipe for this exact meal next question that looks too good to be true i'm not eating that I agree. I think I'm that's cool, So I'm going to say that's good enough to eat. Oh, all right. One is saying that's good enough to eat. The other two are absolutely no way I'm going to touch that. And you would be correct. Please, that is one would have some serious indigestion after eating this one <laughs> because it is a potato that has been sprayed by steam or fire hydrant or something. And yeah, they do you? that to make it look like it's more steamy in the in the photographs. Wow. I'm really hungry. We're just kind <laughs> of gross. That almost looks like a mint leaf on top too. Am I wrong? Yeah, it does a little bit. Like a little basil or something. Yeah, it definitely does a little bit. 
All right, next one. How about this? I'd eat it. Looks like some kind of fish. I would eat salmon. Esque thing. Some salmon with some jasmine rice, maybe. Let's find out. You would be correct. That is a real meal. A real photo of a real meal. And it was salmon. You guys are correct. By Healthy Nut or Health Nut. Next one. Does that? So we have a picture of some barbecued chicken. It's got some thick, good looking barbecue on there. I'd say no. Yeah. I wouldn't need that. Chanel's taking a closer look. I say no. No. So we have three no's. Okay. So three, there's no way you would eat that. Well, let me tell you something. You would be correct because it's actually shoe polish on there. So they take barbecue chicken, rub some shoe polish on it to make it look like it's nice and charred. Um, and in my opinion, that is nasty. <laughs> Probably a little. All right, next one. How about that? Does that look good enough to eat or there's no way? So we have a glass of ice cream. I don't know what it is. Something. Some kind of liquidy smoothie-esque thing with a strawberry and a kiwi in it. I'm going to say yes. It's good enough to eat. All right. I wouldn't eat it. It's too good to be true. I would not eat it. <laughs> so Chanel and Nicole, once again, nope, they would not eat it. Juan is diehard to eat anything that we show them <laughs> at this point. Well, Juan would be the winner this time because that is a real recipe oh. by Carmen Fryer. She is super easy. Fruit dip is what she's created. Again, it's on allrecipes.com. Looks fantastic. And I'm starving at this point. <laughs> Next one. Yeah. This can't hurt. Bowl of cereal. Automatic no. Can't no. tell them. It's not quite Chex. It's maybe a Quaker yeah, Oats, some sort of cereal. <laughs> I wouldn't need it. All right, so is that three would not eat? Three no's. Three no's? All right, let's find out. The answer is? That is glue. <laughs> not milk, oh glue. <laughs> so what they do is they take glue, put it all over that bowl, and then they plop the cereal in there to make it look like it's thick, creamy milk. But also it helps so the cereal doesn't get soggy when they're taking these photos. And that was also being nasty. Getting towards the end here, how about this one? It's like some Fish. cups of strawberries and granola maybe, some whipped cream in there. I'm gonna say no again. I'm gonna go with yes. All right. Chanel, how about you? Looks good enough to eat. I'll be too long. I'll eat it. <laughs> All right. Let's see the answer. The answer is you would be wrong again. That is not whipped cream. That is shaving cream. Wow. Oh. That's exactly what made me said no to the last one. I'm always skeptical of dairy products and shoes. They never use the cream. Yeah. <laughs> so shaving cream again. It doesn't spoil. It doesn't make the food all soggy. Kind of keeps that perfect form in there for those photographs. All right, how about this one? Can't be yes. harmless. Just a burger with some cheese and bacon and some onions. Oh, I'm not an onion person. Diehard burger fan. Mm. Yes, I'd eat it. Yeah, All right. Same. Same. Okay. Is it too good to be true? Let's find out. You are correct. It is not too good to be true. It is a bacon, egg, egg and avocado burger by Miss by Love to Cook 32. Again, on allrecipes.com. I believe this is our last one. Just a piece of chicken. <laughs> Nothing can hurt that. Piece of chicken. Some oven roasted no. chicken. My last no. No. Nicole? I'll say yes. I'll say yes. I need so, it. So we have two two no's and a yes from Nicole. She would eat this oven roasted chicken. Well, congratulations, Nicole. You have got yourself a tummy ache. <laughs> because this chicken 
for advertising purposes, they actually shove it full of paper towels or cotton balls or whatever they can do. And then they heat it up super fast and sew it up to make it look nice and plump, even though it's really a disgusting chicken full of <laughs> paper towels and cotton balls. Gross. So that is our game. Grant, who is our winner today? McTabs uh, looks like, ooh, we might, oh, good Lord. We have a three-way tie for first place. Wow. Nice. <laughs> Everyone got seven correct. We're professionals. <laughs> that, is, that is good. So we'll go with everybody as a winner. Give yourself a pat on the back. Well done. That's awesome. You guys have Good spotted. Job, so thank you. Good job to you. Out of the 10 images of pictures, you guys got seven of them right, which means three of them you would not want to eat. <laughs> <laughs> very cool. Very cool. So uh, um, now that we know what you will eat and what you won't eat, um, either way, uh, we want to get an idea, just share your story about how you entered a career in culinary and what led to where you are now. So we can start with anybody, just kind of popcorn out. Where'd you, where'd you start? How'd you get there? And how did it lead you to where you are now? I'll start. Um, how did I get where I am now? Is anyone's guess. <laughs> um, <laughs> I initially... Uh, I graduated in the midst of what I would say is a recession at the time, the last recession. Um, and I, it took me the full 12 years of my education to realize that I had a passion in cooking um, and that it was even a career road path. Um, because growing up, I had always been pushed towards white collar careers. Um, and so I went the traditional route. I attended a four-year university, I graduated, and as soon as I crossed the stage, I signed up for culinary school. <laughs> I had been accepted straight out of high school, but I was too afraid to move across the country away from my parents. Um, and once I graduated from college, I said, forget it, this is what I really, really enjoy doing. I've, I've delved in and gotten some experience, and this is what I wanna do, this is my passion. So I went to culinary school. I started working in the industry. Um, a few years in, I worked in corrections. I worked in catering. I worked in restaurants. I worked in um, mass manufacturing. And now I'm teaching the future students of, of our industry um, and happy to be doing it because I love it so, so much. Quite a path. <laughs> Cool one. I've always uh, loved to cook. Um, I had to out of necessity because my mother worked and she wasn't a very good cook. So I was experimenting <laughs> in the kitchen as a teenager. And when I went to college, I wanted to be a teacher because I really liked working with kids. And I found a major that was kind of an umbrella major where you teach kids life skills, things like child development, culinary, fashion and um, landed a job out of college teaching culinary and loved it, got to dive a lot deeper into my subject matter and um, started training students for competitions. And I myself got better at my knife cuts and things like that because I didn't go to culinary school. And I've been doing it for 14 years now. In the program, we get a chance to cater events. So I've gotten some experience with that, but my, my culinary skills have definitely evolved um, as I've grown older, and I love every minute of it. So I myself got started in high school with uh, Chef Nicole. Um, I started off as a sophomore in her class due to the fact that I did not show up to pick my electives, so they threw me into a cooking class. Um, I remember the first thing we ever made was pancakes, and I was just so excited to be able to learn how to create my own breakfast, um, lunches, the the more we progressed with our class, the more, you know, advanced our food got. Um, I joined the CCAB, as she mentioned earlier before the podcast, and was fortunate enough to get myself a scholarship to the Cordon Bleu. So I got my associate's degree in the Cordon Bleu. I got a, I've been having the blessing to like work in really well-known upscale restaurants, which has really developed my palate and my skills. Mm -hmm. And I believe through the hard work and the time that I put in is what 
got me through where I am right now, which is a sous chef and a proud current owner of Satisfied LA. That's, that's very awesome. Cool. Yeah, that's Those really are cool. Three really different paths. Yeah. Kind of neat, though. Yeah. So, Juan, kind of divert a little bit. Can you talk a little bit about what Satisfied LA is? What is it that you do? And yeah. Satisfied LA is my baby. So, basically, um, I started in 2018 in my best friend's apartment um, due to the fact that I was very unhappy at my job. I started doing meal preps, basically. Just okay. people that I knew uh, would go out to, like, barber shops and be like, hey, I know you guys are tired of eating tacos down the street. How about you let me cook for you and bring your lunch every day? You know, I'm not working. I will deliver it to you by 12 o'clock. From there, um, I had people tell me, you know, I want, I'm having a big party. I would like for you to cater it. I started doing that. Um, I got into the catering business as a full-time job, and I'm just – I fell in love with it. So my vision for Satisfied is – to turn it into an upscale kind of like luxury fine dining type of catering. So, yeah. That's cool. That's a great, and that's a great business to have. So, you know, and I, I love that you brought that up as, you know, people are asking you to, to do more meal prep and, and people yeah. are, I feel like people are more um, open to wanting, you know, to people helping them prepare foods and, and whatnot. So, uh, so that brings us to our next question. So, you know, we, we've been dealing with this pandemic officially for a year now. And I think some of the biggest industries that have been affected by the pandemic has been medical, um, us as educators and definitely the food in- industry. So can maybe each of you just share, like, how has the pandemic affected your careers as culinary um, artists? And then um, what plans do you have, or do you think you hope to have, like, as the year progresses and we start to, you know, fingers crossed, start to return to somewhat normal of a, of a life? Yeah, well, education has been hugely affected. Um I had to shift gears and brush up on my technology skills as we transitioned to distance learning where students were learning how to cook online. And I was fortunate enough to be able to continue doing my job, but it definitely looks different. I'm not in the kitchen cooking with kids. So we had to uh, distribute ingredients for kids to cook at home. I had to find a way to teach them that. So it's a lot of uh, filming demonstrations for students having them cook at home, sending me pictures and trying to um, give them critique on their cooking via pictures and video. And it's, it's been a learning opportunity for all of us, for me and my students. We focus a lot on reflecting on how they make their dishes themselves, which is good because they're not always going to have me looking over their shoulder critiquing their meal anyway. Um, while there's been plus sides to this, I'm definitely looking forward to going back with my students. There's something about um, having them in the kitchen, cooking together, that camaraderie. I'm sure Juan could attest to that in the back of a kitchen. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And then Chanel, I'll kind of brag on you a little bit. You know, you, you have come into out of the culinary industry to where now you are on the teaching side of it. And this is your first year teaching. So at this moment, you've only taught through distance learning. You've not yet had students in person. And how have you gone about teaching in those skills? And again, like, how's it really, how's the pandemic affected, you know, what you're, what you're doing? Um, well, to go off of Nicole, it's definitely different to teach someone via distance learning or via virtual uh, connection. You don't have that camaraderie. There are days that I, I'm excited to teach the kids how to make something, but doing a previously recorded demonstration isn't the same. I, I can't connect with you. I can't um, plug in cameos and, and little stories and tips and tricks. Um, even in doing live demonstrations with the students, one period to a next changes, your timing changes, um, different results and how you can adjust changes. Um, so I'm really excited to have the students be with me physically. Um, as Grant said, we all, the three of us have different paths. And so I've come out of unemployment at the beginning of the pandemic when no one knew what was coming into 2020 thinking, oh, okay, I've, I've fallen into this uncircumcised 
stance where I don't have a job. And so um, like Juan, I started meal prepping for a lot of my friends and, and their extended coworkers who just in upcoming years had tried my cooking, tried my baking, enjoy it. And I thought, okay, it's the beginning of the year. Everyone wants to lose weight. Everyone wants to eat healthy. Let me play into this. I have the skills, I have the knowledge, I have the passion. And then the pandemic hit and everyone was limited to one chicken per household, uh, uh, dry beans, dry rice. Um, but if anything, the pandemic and the loss that our industry has incurred um, has given me some motivation to help students and understanding, yes, it's a pandemic, but listen, there's still things that you can learn as a result of this. If you can learn how to survive off of basic necessities, if you can mm -hmm. learn how to cook rice, if you can learn how to cook beans, if you can learn a multitude of different recipes to make with flour and milk, if you know how to work with these basic ingredients, you can survive off of minimal things. We've done it in previous years. That's how we made it to the year 2020. We've always known how to survive and thrive. We just never had an iPhone in front of us telling us to doubt ourselves about it. Right. Um, and so it's, it's impacted me. You can't share not only with your students, but with your friends and your loved ones. So a lot of me motivating my students has been, if we could be together, if you could be with your loved ones, if you could send someone something to try to um, supplement that camaraderie that's missing. Um, but I'm definitely faithful that of all of the industries that will bounce back once we do return to normalcy, once we do start to come out of the pandemic level by level, tier by tier, Culinary and hospitality will definitely bounce back because everyone wants to travel. Everyone wants to enjoy eating with their loved ones. Everyone wants to feel comfortable. And what brings people together more than food? Uh, that's awesome. Love that. Yeah. Um, so for me, as negative as the pandemic was, for me, it was kind of a like a blessing because nobody was eating out. You know, Nobody wanted to go to the market. Nobody wanted to really do much. So that's when the meal preps kicked in for me. I got I got really busy with meal preps. Um, my job got really busy with meal preps. More people wanted just things done for them, you know. Um, I started doing my pop ups because of the pandemic. You know, a lot of people's uh, a lot of favorite restaurants from people were closed. So that was my opportunity to get out there and like show people what I got. Like get my get my food out and. Yeah, it's been it's been pretty good. It's been a pretty good year, despite all the negativity that's been going on. I think I I learned how to adapt really quickly to it, um, thanks to the knowledge that I have from previous restaurants that I've worked at. So, despite all, like I said, despite all the negativity, um, it's been a pretty good year for me. Very cool, and that's a good. Sorry to ground jump in. And that's a good. I love that you brought that up because. Um, it's not that people stopped eating once we went into the pandemic. We just changed the way we were doing it. It's neat to hear how you were able to evolve what, what people traditionally did, such as going to a restaurant and being able to create a business out of it to where basically you were bringing the restaurant to them. So. Yeah, that's always been that's always been my main focus, you know, whether it's food on a on a fine china or food in a twenty eight ounce disposable plate, like just make it beautiful, make people feel comfort and and the small things that they took control during these crazy times, you know? Yeah, for sure. It's a great, great insight. Love it. So cool. And three different perspectives on really the human condition. I mean, really at the heart of who is impacted the most, I would say the culinary industry was impacted more than education um, just because of the drastic shift in how people eat. Um it was so crazy. I've heard so many stories. So um, kudos to the three of you for rocking and rolling right through it and kind of taking that, what would you call like that American condition, if you will, and using it to your benefit to learn new marketing and to mm -hmm. learn how to, to adapt, and adapt and overcome, which is going to happen all over again, right? right. Um, yeah. So our industry yeah. is one of the underappreciated essential workers of the pandemic. No one For really sure. realized how impacted you are if suddenly all of food service shuts down. Mm -hmm. Anyone who feels unconfident or uncomfortable with boiling water to boil an egg, what would you do? How would you survive? 
Yep. Yep. And that's exactly when people start hoarding the supermarkets, right? <laughs> Where's Smashing the top right ramen? The job. I know, right? Oh. Hey, so, I make a mean top ramen. Oh, I bet. You just got to spice it up a little bit, right? Like you take that <laughs> sodium filled packet and throw it out and put something else in there. <laughs> so um, I can tell you about all of my secret recipes, but I don't know if we're, we have enough time for that. <laughs> but in thinking about like your story, your journey, and not just through the pandemic from the beginning and all the way through the pandemic to where you are now, you've got some great experience consider the fact that y'all have some sort of tie to education. If you were to sit down with some freshmen, Juan, who showed up to pick their electives and they had the opportunity to um, move into the culinary industry, what advice would you give them to make that choice to say, yes, I'm going to do this. So for me, um, if they wanted to go into it professionally, I've actually had the opportunity to go to Chef Nicole's class and talk to her, some of her students. Um, one of the most common questions I got was like, how many hours do you work? And, you know, being um, not only an owner of a company, but a sous chef at another one, it's like having two full-time jobs, you know? You're pulling anywhere from 75, 80, 85 hours a week. And, you know, it's, it's tough. It's something that you gotta be, I feel mentally strong and physically most of all because you know it's a lot of it's a lot of mental when you're running your business because you're obviously handling the marketing the spending the where am I going to get set up what I need to bring and you know you just I think it's all in the passion you know you got to really you got to really really love what you're doing and be willing to wake up at four in the morning and not sleep until 9 10 p.m to to get where you want to be you know I think one um, hit the nail on the head with describing the culinary industry and what it's like to work in a restaurant, the physical and mental demand. And what I tell students in my pathway is use my class to figure out if this is really what's mm -hmm. going to motivate you. If you love coming to class every day, you love the chaos of being in the kitchen, then that's not going to feel like a job. And your journey through post-secondary options after, you know, the CTE class is over when you go to college or when you're taking courses is not over. You're going to shift and pivot as you discover different interests. You know, I went to school to be a teacher. I wasn't planning on teaching in culinary. In fact, I taught other classes like child development and you just kind of go with the flow and um, you set your goals, but the path might zigzag a little bit and your end goal might look a little bit different than when you started out. Fortunately, the culinary industry is so large that you could do a lot of things with that. Maybe you want to be a dietitian. Maybe you just want to talk about food all day. Maybe you want to be the food stylist that turns that, um, you know, glue into what looks like cereal. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's I actually awesome. got a that's lot a of cool ideas for content through those pictures you guys showed me. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> just, just take a trip to Home Depot and you're set. Yeah, mm -hmm. buy a bunch of glue and um, shoe wax and we'll be good. Yeah, I don't think I'll ever forget the <laughs> moniker Penzoil Pancakes. <laughs> exactly. Absolutely. Chanel, um, how about you? Advice? Both Juan and Nicole hit very good points and I'm going to pivot off of Nicole's point. Um, I always like to tell anyone, whether it be a student or an adult who wants to get better at cooking, um, who wants to go into the industry, find somewhere that you think you want to work. If you like the food, go in and ask if you can walk around, if you can stage, if you can get an internship. Go in and get the real work experience because I'm controlling this environment as a classroom, much in the same way that another chef would control their kitchen. But each one's gonna be different. Your first period's different from your second period. One chef, the way they run their kitchen is different from another chef. Everything's gonna be different. But the best way for you to really find out if you're interested before you even sign up for a program or for a class for financial aid, get that free experience. See if you want to wake up at 4 a.m. on Christmas so that you can go feed a whole lot of people who you will never see their faces right. while you're not with your family on Christmas 
to then get home, be tired, and then maybe have enough energy to spend with your family. To not want to eat the Christmas meal because you just finished cooking a whole <laughs> Christmas menu. You just want to spend time with your family. Or um, you've worked, like Juan said, an 80 or 85 hour week. Back when I used to work um, as a cook in the prisons, I would work these graveyard shifts, these extended overtime shifts. And at the end of a week, I'd go, why do I feel so antsy? Why do I feel irritated? Oh yeah, I haven't baked anything. Let me go bake something. So I would leave my full-time job in the kitchen to go home and get back in the kitchen to de-stress or to relax or to feel more at ease. And that was something that none of my other prior jobs and work experience fulfilled in that way for me. I would leave my office job. I would leave um, my barista job. I would leave whatever other field it is that I was working in outside of the kitchen because I went in and out of the kitchen over my career path. Whatever it is that I did outside of the kitchen would still lead me right back to the kitchen. Um, so when it came the time when I was unemployed and I said, okay, well, what do you want to do? I said, okay, well, I, at this point, I know I want to be in the kitchen. It has to deal with food, um, but I don't want to work for someone else. I don't want to work a nine to five, achieving someone else's menu ideas or achieving their goal. It's not as satisfying. I make the same recipes and then I'm burnt out after three to six months, right, Juan? You can only make the same menu recipes before you go, okay, I want something new. What can I create now? Mm -hmm. um, so let me teach people who don't know how to create for themselves so they can be self-sufficient. Teach kids so they don't have to depend on a dollar menu. As a struggling college student, you know what ingredients to put together to make sure that that top ramen that you pick up actually tastes better when you get it at home and in your bowl. Um, so that's my advice. Get out there and experience it for yourself. My experience, Chef Nicole's experience, Chef Juan's experience, all going to be different. And we're all going to advise you in different ways. But only you know what's really going to satisfy you and, fit and, and fulfill you. So get out there, try it. If you don't like it, you tried it. You didn't like it. Yeah. If you thought you like didn't like it, it will stick with you. And you'll remember it. And you'll go, hmm. Like Juan said, I'm not happy with this job that I'm at. But you know what job I did really like? Even when I didn't like my pay rate or my coworkers, or the job that I was doing. I liked when I was in the kitchen. I liked when I could do this, or I liked, uh, even if I didn't really know how to cook or be confident and I was just a prep cook, I liked having friends that work the line because they slide me good food. It's a family in the kitchen. It's okay. like one of the best families that you can be with and they feed you creatively. It's, it's great. I love my industry. <laughs> we can definitely tell. And I think I almost heard a, a hint of a new uh, course uh, that you could teach there in terms of like titling it like gorilla teach gorilla cooking tactics, you know, and uh, that's where you take the, the standard fare uh, dollar menu items and make them into voila. <laughs> And then we can have Chef Juan judge and see if they're good enough for. Um, you no, know, it's a really, it's a really good topic. I'm actually, I actually have a TikTok page, and I'm currently doing a segment where I'm teaching people how to make healthy fine dining meals under ten dollars. So nice. and people are loving it. People what? are loving us. Very cool. So number one, what is it called? <laughs> uh, my TikTok is at satisfied.la. Check it out. My Instagram is the same. Okay, we're gonna put both those in the description of of this video. Thank you. Nice. Very cool. So uh, this is an impromptu question. Um, actually, I have two impromptu questions. First one is part of the reason why I want to put this together is because my wife and I are like diehard into kitchen. No, I'm sorry. Hell's Kitchen right now. Never before yeah. watched it. And I can't understand like why these people go through what they're going through. Chanel, you helped answer some of that in that in your last discussion. But I was wanting to know like, is that really real? Like, do people yell and scream and like they're throwing plates around and sweating and crying and all of that? <laughs> um, based on my experience, um, it is a little dramatic. You know, they have to. That's just that's just TV. TV. But I have had instances where chefs use f bombs at you, where they try to belittle you, and that's. I mean, in my style, in my kitchen, at least, we, we don't we don't run things like that. You know, I like to show respect to anyone 
and everyone, starting from my dishwasher to my boss and owner. You know, I treat everybody the same way I would want to be treated just because I've been through that, you know, being I'm only 23. I'm a sous chef. Like, it's hard for me in the beginning to, like, get new people who are much older than I am to kind of, like, take me serious, you know, because they're like, I'm I'm five foot six, you know, they're like, who is this little kid? Like, look down at me, like, who are you, you know? So, you know, by, by me respecting not only myself, but my teammates, I get, I get to earn their trust, you know? And I feel like all, all that extra stuff about yelling and putting people down, you know? There's times where I do lose my cool and I'm just like, you know, like using stronger words than I should, but you know, everybody knows that it's all love and it's all because, you know, I really care and love my job and what I do. And I like every single dish that I throw out to look perfect and be the best that it could possibly be quality wise and look wise, you know, but I don't know all that extra that stress pressure. really comes out during the dinner rush, right? Oh man, yes. we're, we're playing 300, <laughs> 300 plates that all have to look the same and remain hot in a 28 ounce cup, like plate, you know, it's, it's the mentality is just there, you know? And, and that was what I wanted to add is like that. And that's what I'm learning. So my wife was a server, I don't know, like five or six years. Right. And so um, so we're watching this show together and she's telling me things like words, whole new terminologies I was never aware of before. And I'm like, what, what did they just say? And why do they say that? And just the amount of communication that has to go on in the kitchen between so many different chefs doing so many different things and just straight impresses me about how, how intense it could be, but also how much you guys have to communicate with what you're doing, you know, when you're doing the line or whatever it is. Okay. It's eight hours of behind you, hot, coming through. Um, oh, my God, I have something in the oven. On your side, timer <laughs> going off, water going off. Don't slip on that. Can I get a dish? I need a new rag. Give me some <laughs> new sanitizer. Where is, that five minutes. <laughs> Where is that pot that I asked for? Where is that dish I asked for five minutes ago? <laughs> but it is the most intense active and exciting environment to be on. You get on the line and you immediately want to get off because it's hot, it's packed, and there's way too much going on, especially if you're in the middle of a dinner line. Um, but you get off of the line and you're like full of adrenaline and you might have a couple new burns. Maybe you've cut yourself if you weren't tucking your fingers. Um, you clean up. And a whole hour, maybe an hour and a half later after cleanup, you go out and you have food with your coworkers and you, you chill and you reflect and you go, all right, cool, that's done. Now what about tomorrow? Because you want to get back on the line. You don't want to feel defeated. You don't want to feel conquered. You don't want to feel like you didn't show up and pull your own weight with the rest of your team because it is a team. It takes everyone in their station, in their element to have their timing right to have their seasonings right, to have their measurement right, to have their preparation right. You can't be on the line and then run out of food. You have plenty of time to get it the way that it was supposed to be. Right, Juan? You have and to even, show up. Even if you're in the middle of a rush and you run out of things, you better believe you're going to be You're getting the grams of the approach. <laughs> but I will say, Chris, and both Juan has said it, but Nicole, you can also jump in too. I think that Hell's Kitchen is an older, old-fashioned way that a kitchen's been run. Okay. A lot of my older chefs tell me those stories. They're the ones who, yeah, I've thrown a hot pan at someone. Yes, I've thrown a knife at someone in the kitchen. Yes, I've had a knife thrown at me. Yes, I've been cussed out by my, my sous chef and then my executive chef and then sent back to the line. That's normal. Yes, I've burned myself and had to keep working over a hot grill. Um, it's about tenacity, though, because it, now it's about respect. You, you, There's so many people who have gone through the kitchen and you know this isn't the way to get to the end. You don't have to be little people to get them to grow. You don't have to make people feel less than in order for them to produce and to perform better. Um, so yes and no. I've definitely seen that. I've visited kitchens over the decades where it was the same chef in the kitchen. And I was like, who, who are you? Like you used to yell at kids, you used to throw things and they're completely Zen. They may have to say something a couple of times to get it done. But um, I had one chef describe it to me as, you know, I didn't, I, 
it wasn't comfortable being that way. I didn't like yelling at people. And I just thought, you know, I can get the same result by being respectful, be, you know, saying it a few times. So it's funny you say that, Chanel, because I've definitely seen that even in the same kitchen with the same chef, that attitude shift. Mm -hmm. Okay. Very cool. So my last impromptu question was, what is your passion thing to make? Some people are bakers. Some people are barbecuers. What's your like, if you had one meal left to make, what would it be? That's so hard. Right. It's not like I'm asking you to like pick your favorite kid or anything. I'm gonna have to say my favorite thing to do is smoking, smoking meats, smoking anything from briskets to barbecue ribs. You know, I love, I love the the details of having to burn wood for 16 hours at the same temperature. You know, so if I had to make one last meal for the rest of my life, I would definitely be smoking meats. Okay. Good. Very cool. Prepping my food relaxes me. That just mise en place thing with my knife is what does it. So anything that requires that, I, I really enjoy. Uh, it is hard, Chris. I don't even have a signature meal. I don't have one meal that I enjoy making. I don't have one meal that I think I make best. But I would, I would have to default to baking. I'm, I'm trained in culinary and savory. Um, but I'm self-trained in baking, and and that just, like Nicole said, it bends me. Like mm -hmm. shaping dough, watching dough rise, um, making pasta from hand on the culinary side, but um, baking a cake and getting it just right, making frosting and replicating it. I'm I'm a chef at heart, so I don't measure, and baking is all about precision. Baking is making sure it's consistent that it's it's right before it hits the oven or before you chill it or making sure your ratios are right so that it sets up and that's a challenge for me that consistency always keeps me motivated to get better so i would say baking. very cool love love that about chanel i remember we did a i i made a cookbook for our our school district which was a bunch of recipes from people and i said chanel how come I don't have a recipe from you? And she said the coolest thing ever. She said, that's because all the recipes are in my head, not on paper. <laughs> like, oh! She's like, and you'd have to buy special tools to make more recipes. And I was like, what? <laughs> Although Very. just this past weekend, Chris, I, I developed a gorilla tactic technique for cooking because I was being lazy. And um, I think I have like a... a a good way to make mashed potatoes without a masher, like make fluffy mashed potatoes without a masher. I need to try it a few more times to see if it's fail proof. But yes, gorilla tactic number one, mashed potatoes. No Does mashed. it involve two bowls? No, a pot and a tablespoon. That's it. Okay. Okay. All right. I can't wait to try them. <laughs> Special episode coming up next, folks. <laughs> Looking forward to it. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll go ahead. So, so at the conclusion of each uh, podcast, we like to ask for a mentor shout out because part of what we do is we um, are do we do career technical education for the state of California, but also we help teachers um, with mentoring and and the mentoring process. And so, uh, what we ask is at the end of each episode, if you guys could uh, give a shout out to a mentor. It could be a teacher, a family member, just anybody who has really inspired you along your journey um, that you really want to give credence to. I had a teacher when I was first starting out who not only taught me how to teach, but taught me um, all about food and basically how to get students involved in competitions. And that's the thing I'm most proud of is watching my students succeed. So I'm going to give a shout out to her. Her name's Kathy Gare. Thank you, Kathy. Very cool. Let's go next. If I were to pick someone, there's one chef that I had early on in the industry who really made an impression on me. He was not classically trained. He didn't go to school. He fell into it and then just loved it and kept going. Um, and he always talked about how, because he wasn't classically trained, um, he, once he advanced to being a chef, a lot of people didn't have respect for him. Um, and he was okay with that. He acknowledged that he wasn't classically trained, didn't put on a showboat, um, but he did 
managed to work with people enough to earn their respect so that even if he wasn't classically trained, they understood, yeah, you're, you're skilled, you have the technique, you have the knowledge, you have the passion, um, and you thereby earn my respect. Similar to what we said earlier about how Hell's Kitchen is over-dramatized. Um, and his name is Chef Noah. Um, he's always told me, you have to adapt. If there's anything that I can teach you is the ability to adapt through time. You have to adapt or else you'll grow old and the world will pass you by. Um, and I think I always remember those words when I'm faced with a challenge in the current position or uh, a life challenge. If I don't know what direction I want to go in life, if I'm not sure if I'm doing the thing that I really should be doing, I want to be doing, I always think, okay, just adapt. Like adapt to your environment and keep going. That's that's mm -hmm. how you, you keep progressing. That's how you remain tenacious. And so I would definitely um, want to give him his props, Chef Nellan. Very cool. Okay, well, I honestly owe this to two chefs. One of them is going to be Chef Nicole for, you know, putting me on to, to CCAP for, you know, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have be, I wouldn't be where I am without her because she pushed me to go from my sophomore year to my senior year of, you know, cooking. She kind of just pushed me, you know, I was kind of alone at that moment in, in high school. So having her like take time of her day to like take me to, to, um, what was that restaurant that we went to, Chef, when you took me? With the C Jonathan Club. The Jonathan Club, man. That was my first ever, like, fine dining experience. And I was like, this is it. Like, you see that chef right there with the executive chef right here? Like, that's that's me, you know? That's where I want to see myself in 10, 15 years. So, you know, thanks to her, I got my scholarship. I don't owe Le Cordon Bleu a single dollar, thankfully. Um, okay. And my second chef is going to have to be um, my chef, Ricardo. He was the one that I begged for months to give me my first job at a fine dining restaurant at 17 years old. Um, he taught me everything I know now from cutting a lemon wedge to brining and smoking and all that stuff. So thank you. Shout out to you guys. Very cool. That is awesome. You make my sentimental okay. heart flutter. <laughs> oh, geez. I feel like we could keep talking for the next two hours. Yeah. I mean, there's so much in there. So I guess that brings us to a close for today. So we'd like to thank you so much. Thanks to the panel. And thank you to the audience for listening to the CTE Teach podcast. We hope you've enjoyed your time with us as much as we have with you. And we'd also invite you to follow along with us on Twitter at CTE underscore teach or on multiple different podcast stations, including our YouTube channel, all at CTE Teach. So, so thank you so much. And uh, thank you so much for, for being here panel. We really appreciate you. And, and each month in our episode, we like to close with an inspirational quote. And I thought as we were talking about adapting and being flexible and everything that has gone on in the culinary industry, a quote from world renowned chef, Mr. Gordon Ramsay would be appropriate. And he said, I don't like looking back. I'm always constantly looking forward. I'm not the one to sort of sit and cry over spilt milk. I'm too busy looking for the next cow. So thank you again for joining us and we'll see you next time on the CT Teach podcast. Bye. Bye.